warm weather of Seville tomorrow. Okay, so the next speaker that we have is uh, Professor Elisa Carlino. She's a professor, a researcher in the neuroscience uh, department in Torino, and is one of the most prestigious um, researchers, especially will have to do with the placebo effect and what it has to do with the powerful response that it has and the response in the brain. So you have the floor. Thank you. So don't raise your expectations. Um, I would like to thank the organizers for the, the kind invitation in this beautiful city. Uh, and actually, I would like to thank uh, the, the previous speaker because uh, Katia uh, and uh, Varnia introduced the placebo effect, and so it's quite easier for me to talk about the placebo effect. Uh, that is actually uh, a fascinating topic. Uh, I'm working in Turin for uh, uh, about, uh, I work with this topic uh, uh, for a lot of years, and um, actually. Uh, I would like to, to, to have a step backward because uh, um, I would like to, to talk about definition about placebo and placebo effect and then we will move on the mechanism about placebo and placebo effect and then about the clinical implication. This is an overview of my talk. And um, I think that it's important to, to make a step backward because uh, um, we have every time a problem of definition when we talk about placebo and placebo effect. In fact, there's a lot of confusions. I think that everyone has in mind, when we talk about a placebo, has in mind a sugar pill or a glass of water. This is true, but it's not true. I mean, a placebo is not a sugar pill and not a glass of water, because if placebo is a sugar pill, it means that the placebo effect is the effect of a sugar pill. But a sugar pill has no active properties. I cannot give you a sugar pill for cure your pain or treat your depression or treat your anxiety, because the sugar pill has no active properties. So there's a confusion. Sometimes the placebo are considered inert medication just to please a patient. Oh, please shut up, take this uh, and go away. Sometimes there's a, a, they, they are identified as a way to detect mystifying patient. <laughs> if you respond to a placebo, probably you are not in a painful condition because you respond to nothing. But I hope that at the end of my talk, I convince you that placebo is not this. Uh, the placebo and uh, the placebo effect is a, a really good model in neuroscience now, and uh, I, I will come back to this later because I think that I will convince you about this. Uh, in order to define a placebo, I would like to start with the definition of a real drug. So what is a real drug? It's a molecule that has a specific active properties. When we give a drug, so when we give a medical treatment to a patient, for example, a medical treatment against pain, so we need to decrease pain in our patient, what can we do? We give a drug or a medical treatment, a procedural treatment, but we give this treatment in a specific contest. This contest, you can see, is made of different things. For example, verbal information. Dear patient, take this drug because it is very powerful and will be uh, a good aid for your pain. You will have a decrease in pain in two hours. Trust me. This is a strong verbal information. Then in the contest, there's also uh, physical aspects that are really important. Our treatment has a shape, a color, a test, and these are information. Uh, moreover, we are in a, a specific office when we give our, to our patient the treatment, and this office, again, has the specific properties. We are wearing our, our white coat, there's a lot of medical staff around us, and then our patient has expectation, and Katia told us that expectations are really important, prior assumptions. And then 
we have previous experiences. So probably we have already experience uh, uh, with a specific medication. And when we have this medication again, we recall that experience. Ah, I take that medication two hours ago or two years ago. And uh, the medication was, was quite useful. You can see that all this information represent the psychosocial context that surround every medical treatment. When we give a placebo, you can see that the medical co the context surrounding the treatment is exactly the same. Same expectation, same verbal information, same previous experience, same shape, color, test. But the active drug is not present anymore. So, what is a placebo? Is it the psychosocial contest that surround the medical treatment? Is it the rituality of the contest? So when we give a placebo, we simulate a contest. So it's, you can see that with this definition in mind, it's easier to define the placebo effect. The placebo effect is the effect of this simulation, the effect of expectation of previous experiences and so on. So it's not the effect of a sugar pill, but it's the effect of the contest, it's the effect of the simulation. So now everything seems fine, but the, this doesn't work anymore. So can you, okay. Um, Actually, when we uh, study the placebo effect, we need to be aware that uh, when we give a placebo and we find an improvement in our group, this improvement can be due to different factors. For example, um, one patient can improve for a phenomenon that is the regression to the mean or a spontaneous remission all these are for biases in reporting pain, for example. But uh, we need to consider that these factors are not important for a placebo uh, person like me, <laughs> for someone that studied the placebo effect. So we need to control this factor. We need to be sure that the patient is not improving for other factors, but we need to be sure that he improves because he has expectation, previous experience, or genetic variables related to the placebo responsiveness. So we need to design a quite complicated studies in order, in order to isolate the, the placebo component, the placebo effect, the neurobiological phenomenon from other factors. So we are actually interested in learning, expectation, genetic uh, factors, and this is uh, what we are talking about. Today I will talk to you about this uh, phenomenon, so the improvement that takes place in the patient's brain when a placebo is given. I will start with uh, the psychological approach. Uh, uh, and I will describe you which are the psychological mechanisms that lead to a placebo response. Actually, there's a lot of mechanism, but I will talk to you, we have not so much time, so I will talk to you about two psychological mechanisms that are learning, Pavlovian conditioning, and expectation. Uh, probably you are all familiar with uh, the Pavlovian studies, uh, uh, with uh, the dog that uh, has the, the bell, so here the, the sound of the bell, uh, and then food is presented, and so the dog salivates because there's food. After different pairings of the sound of the bell and food, uh, the dog starts salivation only with the sound of the bell. This is the sort the classical conditioning procedure. Um, in a clinical setting, what's going on? We give the active treatment, for example, morphine. Um, this treatment is delivered in a specific clinical context. All this factor leads to an improvement in symptom, uh, I mean, a decrease in symptom, an improvement in the pathology. After different pairings, and this is the so-called acquisition phase, we find that the clinical contest alone can produce an effect. This is the placebo effect, the effect of the contest. 
you can see here that this effect can go in two different directions. If we give morphine in a contest and the patient received expectation of pain decrease, we have a therapeutic benefit that is a pain decrease. But we can have also the opposite effect. For example, chemotherapy induced nausea, but the effect of nausea can be induced also by the context in which chemo chemotherapy was previously delivered. This is the so-called nocebo effect, is the bad twin of the placebo effect. This is a clinical context. We have the active treatment to treat pain, for example, and we induce analgesia using a real medication in a specific context. What's going on in, a, in a, an experimental condition? Um, I actually work with healthy volunteers, so I'm actually terrible because I give them pain, but I reduce them the pain with the placebo, so it's quite confusing. Uh, what we do is to deliver pain. We pair the painful intensity with different cues. For example, a green cue that we present on a monitor or a plus or a red Q or a minus. Uh, when we present the minus or the green uh, Q, we tell to our volunteer, don't worry, um, the intensity is reduced. So when you see the green Q, don't worry, because you will experience less pain. In this acquisition phase, so we are here, in the acquisition phase, we actually decrease or increase the intensity of the painful stimuli. In this way, we induced a pairing. So the subject really experienced a decrease in pain when, the red is when green is presented and an increase in pain when the red is presented. After different pairings, we give to our volunteer in the evocation phase the same intensity of the painful stimuli, but again we present the cues. The effect is a decrease in pain when the, red cue, when the green cue is presented and an increase in pain when the red cue is presented. This is the placebo or nocebo effect used with a conditioning, uh, obtained with a conditioning procedure. I skip this one. Okay. This is a, a second. Uh, the second uh, approach to describe the placebo effect, that is expectation. We have to consider that expectation and conditioning are not separated. They can work together in inducing a placebo analgesic response. When we uh, use expectation, uh, we can uh, boost a placebo analgesic response through different factors. For example, using verbal, uh, verbal suggestion, and verbal information, the example that I told you before. Dear patient, this is a painkiller, it will be very useful. Uh, you will uh, experience a decrease in pain in a couple of hours. This is a very strong verbal information. You can give this information in the opposite way. Dear patient, I'm sorry, this is a new drug. Uh, there's a lot of side effects and actually it's not so powerful. You can try it. This is a very negative information. A patient that received this information is likely to experience a nocebo effect. So in the cognitive factors, we have a verbal information that can induce a placebo nocebo effect, but also other factors such as desire and hope. If you desire, you really want to experience less pain, this is a, a powerful mechanism that can probably reduce your painful experience. And then the optimism and the opposite, the, the pessimism for the nocebo effect are important variables. Uh, also cooperation and empathy. There's a lot of studies about this. When uh, there's an empathic approach compared to a waiting list approach, uh, the, the decrease of pain is really significant and there's a huge difference between these two approaches. Also when uh, the patient has the possibility to choose the treatment 
if you give to a patient the possibility to choose between treatment A and treatment B, the patient, according to that study of Rose uh, and co-workers, uh, the patient experienced a more uh, decrease in pain perception because uh, there is a sort of uh, participation uh, of the patient in the cure process, in the healing process, and this boosts the possibility to have uh, an improvement in the medical condition. On the opposite, anxiety is a, a really strong mediator of nocebo effect, as well as pessimism, as well as negative information. Okay, so let's go to the, the core center of my presentation, that is the neurobiological approach. I will present you three different types of experiment, pharmacological experiment, neuroimaging experiment, and um, electroencephalographic experiment. All these experiments will prove to you that the placebo effect is something that happens in the brain, and not something that detects a mystifying patient or something that is only a sugar pill. There is something that happens in the patient brain, and this leads to a modulation of uh, symptoms. So let's begin with uh, the neuro uh, the neuropharmacological approach, uh, we know that the placebo effect is related to the activation of different systems. Let's start with the opioid system, that is the first studies and the first well-documented system involved. Basically, the idea is that when we give opioid drug, such as morphine, we activate the opioid system, and this opioid system induced a release of opioid, of course, and a, a decrease in activity in the, the pain matrix, and this leads to analgesia. What happens if we give morphine on day one, morphine on day two, replace morphine with a placebo on day three? This is a condition in procedure because I give a real drug on day one and subject experience a decrease of pain because I give morphine. Then I give the real drug on day two and again the subject experience a decrease of pain because again I gave him a morphine. On day three, I replace the drug with a placebo. What's happening? We find that we have a decrease in pain perception. So it means that placebo activate the same opioid system. This, in this case, there's an endogenous release, an internal release of opioids, and this lead to a placebo analgesia. We can confirm this, uh, the involvement of this uh, pathway using opioid antagonist. For example, if we give morphine on day one, morphine on day two, placebo on day three, with naloxone, we block the placebo analgesic response. Why? Because naloxone is an opioid antagonist, so it's a drug that blocks the opioid system. And so the placebo cannot activate anymore this system because it's blocked by the naloxone, and so we can block placebo analgesia. Another confirmation is that we can boost placebo analgesia giving proglomide. Uh, probably we'll understand the, the proglomide uh, system and the pentagastrin block uh, when we will go to the CCK, key, key, so to the th CCK system. So just uh, keep that in mind but because we will, give to, we will pass to this later. So the opioid system is involved in placebo analgesia. So if we replace an opioid drug with a placebo, we activate the opioid system with a placebo. The same things happen with another system, that is the cannabinoid system. Again, we give a cannabinoid drug, for example, Keterolac. We give this drug on day one, and then we have a decrease in pain perception. We give this uh, uh, drug on day two, and again, we have a decrease in pain perception. We replace this drug on day three with the placebo. Again, we have an activation of the cannabinoid system and a placebo analgesia. Again, you see that the, the schema is, is the same. We can block this effect using an antagonist of the, of the cannabinoid system. 
So we can give, for example, to our subject a cannabinoid drug, so Keterolac on day one, Keterolac on day two, placebo on day three, with the rimonabant. The rimonabant is a drug that, is, that works as a cannabinoid antagonist, so it blocks the cannabinoid system. In this case, you can see that we have uh, a block of the analgesic effect. Another system involved is the CCK system. CCK means cholecystokinin. We know that a nocebo activates this system. So when we give a nocebo drug, that is actually a sugar pill along with the verbal information that it will increase pain, we have an activation of this system. But, and obviously, oh, sorry. Uh, with the nocebo, we have an, hyperal an uh, hyperalgesia, so we have a boost in pain perception and not a decrease. Um, you can see that we can block this effect giving the proglomide. The proglomide is a CCK antagonist, so we block nocebo, nocebo hyperalgesia with the proglomide. We enhance placebo analgesia with proglomide. So you can see that the system are always the same. And so it's clear this part, because we block, we using proglomide, we block the CCK system, and so we boost the placebo effect. Another system involved, but uh, this is quite a uh, new study, so actually there is no, so um, I, I cannot uh, speculate a lot on this, but it, this is a really promising model. Um, a way to boost the placebo analgesia is uh, the use of oxytocin, that is the trust hormone. This is a very fascinating model, and I think that in the in uh, the next years, we'll, we will have a lot of information about this system. So the idea is that the intranasal infusion of oxytocin increase placebo analgesia. So this is an overview uh, about uh, the placebo effect and the pharmacological effect of placebos. So you can see that when we give a drug, we give not only a drug, but a contest, a contest that is made of expectation and previous experiences. When we give, uh, the subject is exposed to previous opioids treatment, there's an activation of the opioid system when we replace the drug with the placebo, and this activation leads to analgesia. But when we uh, expose our patient to cannabinoid drug, for example, we have an activation of the cannabinoid system that leads to analgesia as well. So in this sense, previous treatments are really, really important because we have a sort of memory of this treatment. And when we receive, when we expect to receive the same treatment, we activate the same circuit, the same system, the same pathway, also because we have this memory about the effect that we previously experienced with that treatment. So let's move on to the neurobiological studies. Uh, we know that um, when we study placebo analgesia, it's really interesting to see what's going on in the brain, and we know that uh, now there's a, a lot of evidences about this, there's a, an increase in activity in prefrontal regions. So prefrontal regions are really, really important when we had to study the placebo effect. You can see here the anterior cingulate cortex, for example, the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex are key regions. So when we are in a painful condition and we want to induce a decrease in pain using a placebo, we can expect an activation of this region. Basically, this is the idea. When we give pain, we actually have an anticipation phase, a real painful phase, a painful experience, and then we have a post phase that is the cognitive situation. So let's imagine, as Katya told us, the, the situation of the dentist. We are on the dentist chair. Dentist's hand is coming. Oh my God, pain is coming. 
oh my God, this is the anticipation, okay? Pain is not there, the hand is here. So the dentist is it's quite close, so it's quite far from us, not so close, but we anticipate pain. Then the dentist is coming and pain is coming. After the dentist procedure, we can rate our experience, eight from zero to 10. In the anticipation phase, we can see that we have an activation when we study, when we, uh, we are talking about fMRI studies, we have an anticipation, in the anticipation we have an activation of different brain regions, such as the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, the anterior cingulate cortex, and the, the periaqueductal gray. There's an activation of these regions, and then in when pain is actually there, there's an inhibition of the so-called pain matrix. Posterior cingulate cortex, uh, caudate, thalamus, and putamen, and insula. This inhibition during pain leads to a decrease in pain report. So when we give a placebo, we have, okay, uh, the anticipation of pain relief. There's a, a painful situation, and then the report is no longer eight, but probably six or five or less. So this is the story when we receive pain. Now I will move to the electrophysiological approach. Uh, here again, the, the situation when we, uh, we are talking about healthy volunteers. I work with healthy volunteers. Um, here, uh, I studied the different types of pain and considered that the, the, the type of pain that you use is uh, quite important. I study electrical stimulation and laser stimulations. Uh, basically, what we did is give to our patient a cue in order to induce an expectation. Dear patient, when you see the red light, it means that pain is coming and pain is quite strong. When you see the green light or the minus, it depends on the study, but basically it's the same. When you see uh, the minus, be quiet because the pain is not so hard. You can uh, uh, manage it. So we give pain, we give a cue. Then there's uh, the anticipation phase. Pain is not there, but you expect pain. Then there's the stimulation. Then there's the nociceptive response to pain. Our previous speaker told about the laser evoked potential that is uh, an evoked potential that leads to, that can be seen in the brain. I will explain you how and where. And uh, this potential is a measure of a nociceptive response, uh, is a measure of a nociception. Then we have our pain rating. In, uh, this few minutes, I will describe you two studies. The first one is the lab study, uh, in which we investigated pain rating and the laser evoked potential. Laser evoked potential are uh, electrical brain potential that can be recorded uh, on the scalp. So we use an EEG. The EEG is a very uh, non-invasive approach. Uh, in, during this morning, someone told, asked, uh, is there a possibility to, uh, to study pain in a different way? Y yes, probably we can skip with, uh, we, we can uh, not study only pain with uh, the fMRI approach, but the EEG, the EEG approach is very, very useful also because it's a non-invasive approach and uh, low-cost approach. Uh, here you can see the lap that is a wave that uh, occurs uh, about 200 milliseconds after a laser stimulation. This wave is a biphasic wave uh, that can be divided in two little waves. The first one is this one, is the N2. And because it's negative, two weeks because it peaks uh, more or less 200 milliseconds after the painful stimulation. And then we have the positive peak, the P2. This is the lap complex. And this is a measure of nociception. We investigated this measure and pain rating, in, and this is the first study. In the second one that I will describe you later, 
we decided to investigate what's going on in the anticipation phase. In this case, we studied another evoked potential that is called expectancy wave, contingent negative variation, CNV. Uh, this is a, a very different wave compared to the previous one because it's very, very long. You can see that the latency of this wave is very long. Um, and this wave, but I will describe you later, this wave uh, uh, occurs between a Q, a red or green light, and a motor response. In this case, we ask to our volunteer, please stop the simulation as soon as possible. In fact, we give not laser stimulation, but uh, electrical stimulation. Uh, let's start with the description of the first experiment. This is the experimental procedure. We use a conditioning procedure. So we paired a minus with a decrease intensity and a plus with an increase of pain intensity. We deliver two acquisition sessions. So in this acquisition session, we modulated the intensity. So when minus was presented, we decreased the intensity. When plus was presented, we increased the intensity. In the second session, the evocation session, the intensity was exactly the same, but we give again, the, we presented again the cues, the plus and the minus. So subject expected an increase or decrease of painful stimulation according to the previous experience. We divided our volunteer in two groups, the ver group and the no ver group. The ver group received a conditioning procedure along with the verbal suggestion. Dear subject, you will receive two stimuli. Uh, the higher stimulation are preceded by a plus. The lower stimulation are preceded by a minus. Please rate the stimuli. This is the ver group, a group in which we give the verbal suggestion about the procedure. In a second group, the no ver group, as you can imagine, we give no this information. Dear subject, you will receive painful stimuli. Please rate. Let's start with the results in the ver group. You can see the results here. This is the pain rating. So when subject received in the evocation session, so when the intensity of the laser was the same, they experienced more pain when red was presented and less pain when green was presented. This is placebo analgesic response. Here is the electrophysiological measure. You can see that when red stimuli were presented, the wave, the lap wave is higher. So the nociceptive response, that is a, a brain response to pain, is higher compared with the green line. The green light is when green stimuli was presented, so when low pain was expected. So we have a placebo analgesic response that can be recorded from a behavioral point of view and from an electroencephalographical point of view. This is our conditioning plus verbal suggestion group. This is our results in the no ver group. You can see that there's no differences between plus and minus. So when plus were presented, and the, here is the red bar, they experienced no an increase of pain compared with the, the minus. So there is no placebo analgesic response. And here, you can see that there's no differences in the lap potential. So this is an interesting study, I think, because we can see that when subjects are not fully aware about our modulation, the placebo analgesic response is not present. So conditioning in human beings, when pain is involved, and pain is a conscious experience, is not only nociception, when pain is involved, human beings are involved, uh, verbal suggestions are really important. So the information that we give to our volunteer about a modulation of their pain sensation is really important. 
because without this information, the conditioning procedure is not so effective. This is the other study, the CNV study. As I told you before, the CNV is uh, um, the so-called expectancy wave. So this wave occurs when you expect something and you had to block something using, for example, your hand, using a movement. In this case, we give to our volunteers here a cue, a red, again, a red or a green light. We told to our volunteer, you had to expect more pain or less pain, red more pain, green less pain. Again, we use a conditioning procedure. So in different trials, we paired more pain with an increase in electrical stimulation, less pain, a decrease in electrical stimulation. Again, the, the same conditioning procedure. These are our results in the evocation session, so when the electrical stimulation has the same intensity. So same intensity, but the expectation and previous experiences are different. So we expect our subject expected more pain when red was coming and expect less pain when green was coming. This is the, the wave. You can see that it's quite long, as I told you before. It's a wave that lasts for three, four, three, four seconds. Uh, here, we ask to our volunteer, please stop the stimulation as soon as possible. So when you, we, we give a train of electrical stimuli and subject had to stop the stimulation as soon as possible. We uh, design two groups. And now I describe the results of the conditioning group, this one. You can see that when subject expect more pain, the CNV is higher. When they expect less pain, the CNV, the expectancy wave, is lower. Consider that in this condition, the intensity, the simulation, uh, uh, the intensity of the stimulation was exactly the same. So this is a real analgesic response. This is a real placebo response that occurs not only after the stimulation, but also before. So when you expect something different, there is something different. In, there is something in your brain that gives you the idea that something going on, and the idea is that. When pain is more, when you expect more pain, you have an increase in pain, and you expect this increase. In this condition, we decided you had to, to look at this red line and this green, green line. Uh, we decided to study expectation alone. So subjects were informed about our manipulation. You expect more pain or less pain, but without previous experiences. Because we, we, re we were really interested in the effect of conditioning. So is conditioning so important? Can boost your expectation? The answer is yes. Uh, using a conditioning procedure, you can boost uh, your expectation. You can find here there is a huge increase, but when uh, conditioning is not longer present, you see that there's again a difference between red and green, but it's smaller because you haven't already uh, a previous experience about this. So yes, you trust me, you trust that what I say, but not so much. And so the expectancy wave is just little compared with the situation in which you experience on yourself the modulation. So what about the, the clinical implications? So we know that the placebo effect works. We know that there is a lot of mechanism. There is a psychological mechanism, neuroimaging areas that are activated when we receive a placebo. We know that using an electroencephalographic approach, we can modulate the placebo response after pain, before pain. Yes, this is wonderful. But what about the clinical practice? OK, I think that there's actually five important implications for the clinical practice. The first one is a sort of slogan, no prefrontal control, no placebo response. It means that when prefrontal regions are not fully activated for different regions, 
for different uh, situations in different conditions, we have no placebo response. Let's start with the, this is uh, the previous slide that I show you, the placebo effect occurs when there is an activation of prefrontal regions. Um, this is a very nice study with the TMS, Krumenacker and co-workers uh, um, had this uh, brilliant idea to inhibit for just a, a short period the prefrontal regions. And they find that placebo analgesia is completely blocked when prefrontal regions are inhibited by TMS. This is just a short uh, inhibition, so our volu the, the, their volunteers were not completely uh, crazy in doing this experiment. But in these 10 minutes, so the effect is 10, 15 minutes, is very, is, is very interesting because we know now that the block of this region blocks the placebo analgesic response. So th this is an artificial way to block the analgesic response induced by a placebo. Uh, this is a more natural situation. This uh, is a study in, of a patient with Alzheimer's disease. Uh, we found that uh, when patients uh, report a decreased connectivity of brain regions, uh, the placebo analgesic effect is no longer present. So this is a natural condition. A uh, patient with Alzheimer's disease has uh, uh, have problems in frontal regions, and in that kind of patient, they have an impairment in connectivity of frontal regions, and this results in a, a decrease of placebo responsiveness. Um, this is another interesting study uh, about the relationship between white matter integrity and uh, placebo responsiveness. Uh, and the idea is that uh, uh, the lesser the prefrontal integrity, the smaller the placebo response. This is a, a really interesting uh, second implication about uh, the, the use of placebo and the nocebo effect, and this is the so-called open-hidden paradigm. Previously, I described you what is a placebo? We told that the placebo is the contest. Uh, I think that all of you have uh, an experience, uh, uh, short or long experience in the medical practice, and the idea is that when we deliver treatment, we deliver treatment in the so-called open situation. So we give to our patient a treatment in an open contest. So subject is fully aware about the placebo manipulation, uh, about the, the, the treatment. So the patient is informed that a treatment is coming, is informed about the effect of the treatment, know everything about the treatment. Dear patient, now I give you the treatment, uh, stay calm, uh, relaxed, pain, is going to decrease in a couple of hours. This is an open condition. Subject expect a treatment. We can compare this condition that is a, a classical, a routine medical condition with a more artificial condition that is the hidden condition. You can see that here the patient is linked to a machine, a computer, the computer give the medication and the patient have no idea about the treatment. Uh, I just finished this point, yeah. Um, this is the, the situation, the comparison of pain perception when we expect a treatment and we not expect the treatment. This is the open situation. Subject know that here, the metamizal, that is the painkiller, is delivered. And you can see that after this, the pain rating decreases. Have you an idea about this condition? This is a hidden condition. So you have no idea, the subject has no idea about uh, the infusion. Do you uh, have uh, an idea when the, the, the computer infused the drug? It doesn't work? Okay, here. Do you think that there's an effect? I say no. So this is uh, our last slide, I guess, because there's no time anymore. 
uh, you can see that when we give a drug, we have uh, the real drug effect and uh, the contest effect. So the drug effect, when the drug effect is so small, probably the effect of the drug is actually a placebo effect. So when the hidden injection of a drug is not capable of reducing pain in a significant way, probably it's all about a placebo effect. OK, I think that we have no time anymore for uh, other slides. So um, thanks for the attention. <laughs>